computer. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Today, I have another Meet the Expert interview, and today is Veet. So welcome, darling. Well, so we've known each other quite some time online. It's just that wonderful to meet you kind of in person. Yes, lovely to meet you in sort of person. <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> So, Veep, you know, I kind of got you on because, you know, you're a, a vegan nutritionist. So uh, that, you know, straight away uh, interests me um, and my clients. And I would love to know how you found yourself being a vegan. Were you always vegan or what, what's the story? Right. Yeah, no, I wasn't always vegan, but I was vegetarian from the age of 16. And then um, eight, nine years ago, I became vegan. So I was on, slowly, slowly, I was on my path to be, becoming vegan. Um, I, I, I gave up eggs probably 15 years ago, and then it was the dairy that I gave up eight years ago. So, right. So first of all, what made you at 16 become a vegetarian? Um, I it was health because I just felt awful when I ate meat so I had really been you know um, just like, like my mum used to cook lamb outside because I couldn't handle the smell of it and I felt okay when I ate processed meat that was really weird but um, yeah, yeah you know it had all the salt and but but when I ate I just felt very clogged up so yeah, I um I decided to become vegetarian and my mum said, well, I will help you with this as long as you find out where you can get your protein from because I'm not just going to give you vegetables. And so I went to the library because, of course, there was my age. There was no internet back then. So I went to the library and found out how to do that. And, and then, yeah, I was vegetarian from then on. So was that back in the day... Because, I mean, you know, when I went to university, it was th over 30 years ago, back in the day when we used to think that if you weren't eating animal protein, you had to eat the plant proteins in specific combinations at the same meal. So this is like, you know, where you had to have beans and rice together or, you know, um, peanut paste on toast you know, at the same meal and all that kind of stuff? That wasn't. So I only learned that in the last probably 15 years. And I actually do ascribe to that. I do eat complete protein every meal. Um, but then it was just my mum just wanted to know what, you know, what we could substitute the meat with because she felt that I wasn't going to get all my nutrients just from vegetables. So, you know, I learned Gosh. about pulses and grains and, yeah. um, you know, tofu and and I was still eating dairy and eggs then. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So in actual fact, you were getting mega. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. But I'm glad because because her asking me that question really started me thinking on you know what do I what, what are, is this nutrients what is you know what is this protein up until then I hadn't really thought about that food was food that I loved and and I loved healthy food like my food as a four-year-old my favorite food was salad <laughs> wow that's amazing yeah. amazing yeah. no I'm really impressed too because um you know I, I think we can we definitely live in a protein obsessed culture and I think that we focus way too much on on protein, and in actual fact, we should be way more concerned about getting enough fiber. Mm, mm, yeah, most yeah. people are deficient in fiber and calcium fiber. and calcium. Even meat eaters, mostly meat eaters. <laughs> That's what I'm finding. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, how do you make sure that your clients get enough calcium? Well, I ha I do have a list of calcium rich foods, um, and but I also um, you know eat, making sure that they're having a whole foods plant based diet is super important so that they you know they're getting lots of new lots of calcium from um, when you start eating lots of vegetables and legumes and and grains and you're getting it anyway but um, just also making sure they're diligent because most people that come to me. And myself included, I thought, yeah, I eat all those foods that is on the list. Um, but am I, but then when I sit down uh, at the end of the day and look at what I really ate, I didn't eat those foods. So like have being diligent to make sure that they are in the meals um, rather than just saying, yes, I eat them. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. And do you um, have any, um, any, well, I just noticed it reading, you know, through your um, website that you're very, uh, you make sure that your clients are very much aware of, of phytates and that not interfering with calcium absorption. Yes, that's really important. And, you know, I know that it's, it's, it's a, they can, they can um, inhibit the, absorption of minerals um but i i just you know to really be on the safe side and a lot of people have actually not with calcium but with iron have had difficulty absorbing as soon as they've started soaking and um, wilting the leafy greens their their iron absorption has gone up so um you know that's not scientifically proved proven from me but you know i just noticed that that's hap happening so yes i do but I'm an advocate for soaking because that, and also cooking from scratch. Like I know it's easy to go and get a can of beans and, you know, sometimes that's all you can do, but actually, um, you know, get getting organized so that you are soaking your legumes or your beans the night before is just something that I really, you know, um, emphasize and focus on. So yeah, to get rid of that phytic acid. Yeah, yeah, because that's one of the questions that my clients will ask me because we don't really know if the beans in a can have been soaked, do we? No, no. Okay. And my, it's my understanding, and unless things have changed in the last couple of years, that they actually put the beans in the can and then they put the cans in the big, the big things. Oh to um, boil them and cook them and sterilize them and and so for me that those beans are just sitting there in that phytic acid mm. and I don't think I don't know but I don't you know I don't think that they've been soaking them before and the thing and, and it is okay to have a can of beans now and again you know but it's also like once you get organized, you can cook the um, lentils or the beans in big batches and yeah. freeze them like they do in Mexico. They freeze them in portions and it actually becomes easier and easier the more you do it. So oh, I agree. And it was the one reason why I bought a pressure cooker. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so many, many years ago, because it didn't matter how long I cooked those chickpeas for, they just yeah, didn't yeah. cook. Yeah. Yeah. So I so it was like, yeah, so the I'm gonna... cooks. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the science and because I you know, because this is a big thing for me, but the science is out and this is how it always been cooking the beans. When you actually go to cook them, you know, they've been soaking and then you rinse them, even in the pressure cooker when you soak them, and they do this in India and they do it as an Ayurvedic practice as well, you need to um put boiling water into the pressure cooker or saucepan, bring that to the rolling boil then drain it out and then put more boiling water in and then cook them with starting with boiling water because once the water has reached over 65 degrees it has the ability to get rid of much more phytic acid oh there you go yeah so and and i found that fascinating that you know for generations and generations of people have been doing that in India and then it wasn't only recently that that was proven to be the case that it needs to be you need to start cooking them with boiling water oh I have never heard that yeah I know that um definitely you know using uh, uh you know doing rinsing um boiling and rinsing and all that stuff can actually reduce and it might be the phytates yes uh, whatever can trigger a lot of the gastrointestinal uh, issues when people first come on to being plant-based because yes. they just find that all the fibre, you know, their gut, their gut isn't used to all that fibre and so they are getting more, um, you know, like gas and bloating. Yes, yes. Um, and it can reduce that. So, yes, yeah, it, yes. it, 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 is, it is very interesting. And I agree with you. I think that when you're st first starting the journey, it can be a bit overwhelming um, like, oh, gosh, I wanted to cook my beans and, you know, everything <laughs> as well. But as you get into the the swing of things and you know what you're doing, and that's, that's the trick, isn't it, you know, because you know that's what you're right. doing, you can start to cook in advance and actually it makes it easier because it's not like you're cooking up just one batch of beans. You've been cooking up enough beans for 10 meals probably. Exactly, yes, yeah. And I just think that it's the first first step to self-care is thinking about what you're going to eat the next day, you know. So it's like not coming because, you know, I, I know people and friends that they just decide they get home from work at 5.30 or 6 
seven sometimes and they have no idea what they're going to have for dinner yeah so it's like getting that you know like okay this is what I'm going to have tomorrow mm. and um and you can still be spontaneous around that you know because you've got your beans cooking and um you've got everything there you could just change up the flavor or something on the day if you didn't feel like Mexican if that's what you planned mm. you to make curry quickly <laughs> well yeah I feel like it's a recipe for disaster when you don't know what you're having. Yeah, I and agree. It's one of the things that, you know, I work quite closely with my clients, you know, as you probably do too, making sure that they have some kind of a system in place, yes. you know, whether that's, you know, what you're having on every single night or this is what you're having for the week and you just choose which one you want. Yes, whatever one. works, whatever works for the individual. Yes, that's right. I think you're spot on, spot on. Like knowing in advance. Yeah, exactly. You can't get to a meal and not know what you're eating. It's, yeah. just, it's just a disaster. Yes. Now, yeah. How did you find yourself in a place of having a vegan school? Uh, I was... um. Well, well, I'm actually a primary school teacher first. That's my right. first degree by a profession. And then when I came to the Byron Shire, because that's where I live in the, uh, I was living then, I'm just up the road now, yeah. um, I decided my cooking was, you know, my passion. That's, that's what I thought. So I started a catering business and I catered for 13 years for, uh, for vegetarian, vegetarian food and then vegan food. And I just kept looking, kept my eye on, things around you know what was happening for people who wanted to be vegan chefs and there was nothing there was still was nothing there was nothing when I was 16 there was nothing when I started um at you know my catering business and there still was nothing 13 years later so I thought I'm going to create it because there was so much I could see so many young people wanting to um you know work in the vegan chefing world and there wasn't an avenue but in doing the vegan chef training, I got so many more calls from mums, mostly mums saying, my children have decided they want to become vegan and I need to help, you know, I need to work out how to do this. So I um, started a three-day vegan foundation cooking course and it ran from there. And in 2019, I stopped the catering and just um, solely focused on the um uh, cooking school and and then did my nutrition degree with um, postgrad nutrition degree with um, Deakin University. Wow! Yeah. Awesome! Awesome! Yeah. So then I realised that my passion for it was not just cooking; it's for teaching and educating and helping pe helping people on the you know it it be easier for people on this path. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. I I agree with you. I I just I love. I love the health side of, of yes. you know, vegan eating. You know, it is just because it's so healthy and it can just reverse so many of our lifestyle diseases. And for the women that I work with, it just means that their transition into and through menopause can just be so much easier. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's hard to, unless you've done the experiment and, and I love, you know, doing experiments, you don't actually know how you're going to feel when you're not having, you know, all of those animal products. Yeah, so, that's right. So yeah. what was the um, the linchpin? What sort of pushed you over to the edge from vegetarian to vegan? Okay. <laughs> I made a, um, a pecan sauce similar to a walnut sauce for a pasta. Because I had been on, you know, looking at it, I'd been looking at, um, I'd read um, Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foa and I did, I read, I couldn't read part of it because it was so gruesome and my partner read it and then told me what happened to pigs. It was the pigs that I couldn't read. So even though I was being vegetarian and had given up eggs for my health, I still was looking at the ethics of it as, as well. And, um, and I didn't know if my catering business could, could survive you know without having um eggs and dairy and actually it went it went much better because everyone said the food tasted better without eggs and dairy and these were big meat eaters so yeah that were coming along anyway that's a side um and then so I made this this pecan sauce to go with the pasta because I like the cream sauce with pasta but I would wake up in the middle of the night feeling nauseous and wondering uh, 
wondering if I'd be able to get to the bathroom. The nausea would go, but I always felt nauseous. And I had this um, pecan sauce, was delicious, just as good as the cream sauce. And that night I slept right through, no nausea. And I thought, that's it, it's going. It was just enough to to show me that I, you know, what what it was actually doing to my body. Yeah. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Which is what I find too. You know, I think yes, yeah. like most people are struggling with abdominal issues, health issues that they don't really realize have a link with what they're eating. Yes, yes. I don't I don't know why we have this disconnect between, you know, what we're eating and how we're feeling. And it's just you would experience this as much as I do. You know, people coming back and going, I actually can't believe how good I feel. Yeah, that's, yes, that's so, yeah, yeah. I just can't believe, you know, that I've got energy. My brain fog is gone. I'm sleeping better. Um, you know, I don't have, you know, I'm not feeling, you know, just off all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I have found that when people do, sorry, I've, I've interrupted you, but I have found that when people do transition, that they they will say, oh, but I'm getting much more bloating and I'm not feeling well and that their body is detoxing because it's just getting rid of, and that's what happened to me with the dairy and that's what happened when I gave up coffee as well. So I had known that and I'd read enough to know that that's what people go through and that detox period can take between five weeks and six months. So it's not about... Um, you know, like then going, well, I feel terrible. I've got to go back to eating eating meat. So it's sort of giving yourself that, your body, that time to, to yeah. get rid of all of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so what was the coffee? What was the impetus for giving up coffee? Oh, yeah. I, um, I only had one coffee a day. So, yeah, and I know lots of people say that. I only had one coffee. But I was getting anxiety and um. I, so I would get anxiety for no, and I would look at the reasons of getting up what the anxiety was, and it wasn't really. I, there was no reason for getting anxious over what was going on, and I would wake up in the night crying. And so I thought, I'm just going to try coffee first, you know, because I can't think what else it could be. And I gave up coffee, and the anxiety um, stopped. You know, not completely. I still get anxious now and again, but it wasn't that anxiety for no reason and and I didn't I stopped crying in the night so yeah so it was affecting me on that level but that was a really big one to to kick because even I had tried in the years to give it up but I'd been drinking iced coffee as a child my parents um they thought that it was important to have milk and that was the only way I would drink milk with if, if it had coffee in it. So I would have 300 mils of iced coffee. So I was very addicted even though I was having one a day. So I can't go and just have one coffee now, tomorrow, and then not be addicted again. So it's finished. And that was four years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So interesting you say that because I, I gave up coffee about a year ago and it was only one, same as you. Only one, it was mid-morning after breakfast and I was um, one, re you know, and, and it, it's amazing, isn't it, how it took me about two months to psych myself up. I, go, I, go to, I look back now and I'm just like, oh, really? But it, it, it's a big thing, isn't it, to, to it get is, up? It is it's a whole ritual around it and it, yes. it's a thing that is it's a beautiful thing to you know to have put the coffee pot on if you're doing it at home and to yeah. smell it or to go out with friends yes and so that was and for me to go out for a coffee that had it just had to stop like now I go out for a walk with my friends occasionally I will meet for no I can go into a cafe but it just didn't have that same ritual around it mm. so I just had to change things you know so it is, it's really hard. It, yeah, it is hard because yeah. that society is set up to drink it as well. And I know, I know. I um, I found that I fell asleep quicker. And the other thing is that I didn't have a lunchtime slump. Oh, oh that's fantastic. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I do now, if I go out, I will treat myself to a decaf. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to do what works. Yeah. That's right. Well, a decaf yeah. oat milk or something like yeah. that. 
Um, so for me, we, for me, oh, sorry, just one more thing. For me with coffee, it did give me much more energy. So I was able to, because I work very, I can work very long hours. I can work 16 hours a day. So it was giving me much more energy to keep going. But what I noticed, it was a false energy. So that was yeah. effect, affecting my adrenals. So when I gave it up, I, you know, I just, I'm just saying this because of you saying that you, you know, you've had that slump. Mm. Um, it just, yeah, then I was able to regulate myself better because, you know, I only, I had less, I less, had less energy. It wasn't a false energy, yes. but it wasn't less energy. To, it was a proper energy, you know, it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't a yeah. false energy. So, yeah. 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 It's so it's so interesting, and I, I think that you know this is why I, do, I love experiments because I think that you know when we experiment with you know coming off something like you know alcohol or 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 coffee just to see how it might be affecting our health, and then you know changing up our diet and, yes. and off some of these foods that uh, you know may have uh, you know a negative impact on us. So it's always worth doing the experiment. And always- I think so, yeah. Like when people come with, to me with they've got iron, they're low iron, you know, coffee can, it can be a big absorb, a big uh, cause yeah. malabsorption of iron. And some yeah. people aren't willing to give it coffee up and some people are. So it's just sort of like, yeah, it's, um, it's a good place to start actually. <laughs> you know if you've got iron if you've got iron issues yeah just to see and then see see how it goes yeah yeah yeah, that's right that's right well as we finish up I was as I was you know scrolling through your feed you said you had some creative breakfast ideas oh yes yes okay yeah, so it just depends. Well, it depends on what you like for breakfast, whether you're a savory person and how much time you have. But um, I maybe it's not so creative, but I am a savory person and I love to eat what I had for dinner the night before for breakfast. So I make more dinner and eat that. Yeah. Um, but also I, in winter as savory, I like to make a breakfast congee and I buy brown rice flakes because they cook really quickly. Yeah, and they do. Yeah, yeah. So you get to soak them the night before and then you just put them with boiling water and then I add a little bit of miso, a tahini, vegetables, any vegetables I feel like, and I put kimchi on top and that's really delicious and I'm getting the miso and the tahini and the brown rice flakes. It's all protein and the veggies. Um, there's an Indian breakfast I love, which is also with flaked rice, and that's a poha breakfast, and I have that recipe on my uh, website. Um, yeah. yeah, there's of course there's um, pancakes that can be made, and the beauty of pancakes is that you, they cook so well without oil. Mm. Yeah, so the pancakes that are, is on my website is with buckwheat and brown rice flour, and a banana to sweeten them and to make them really stick well together so they don't break up in the pan. Oh, I'm going to have to go and have a look at that one. I've got to yeah, And then make a fruit, comp- you know, make the night before or on the weekend, make a fruit compote because fruit compote, it's nice and sweet, so you don't need to add any sh- any sugars. Um, oh, there's many. Uh, muffins, as I say, I've got savoury muffins, but they're more for people who have got to run out of the house quickly, you know, or they've got trains to catch and they just don't get it together to get their breakfast. Like mm. I never leave the house without food. Me neither. <laughs> you know, we're very similar. This morning I had to take my girlfriend to the airport and then I had to go shopping, so I had my breakfast packed in my little bag and I've got a gorgeous little bag that I love, so that's part of the breakfast getting the breakfast ritual together so yeah yeah me too that, do you want me to keep going with ideas or is oh, that- yeah I, I'm actually I'm actually really intrigued with that because I have got brown rice flakes um but I've never used them in that way so no, it's it's fabulous yeah yeah because you could make like you say make that up even the night before if that's right you know, that's uh, right just, and that's a quick and easy even lunch or dinner snack as well. Yes, yeah, because I was thinking, because I'm savoury, not every, like, savoury is my, and, and so my friend was saying, I just made a, a porridge this morning and I tried porridge again and I'm like, okay, I just can't do this. I try, you know, and then I thought I'm not going to, a congee takes quite a while to cook, so I'm not going to 
stand there, you know, watching it cook or having it cook each morning for 50 minutes and it's like brown rice flakes, that'll do it. They cook within five or ten minutes max. There you go. And then and so, recipes are on your website. I'm going to be they going. Are. And while that's cooking, while those brown rice flakes are cooking, I've chopped my veggies for dinner for the night. See? Beautiful. <laughs> and, that, and I'm with you. I always say never waste, never waste a moment in the kitchen. If you're in there, you know, for breakfast, do something for lunch. If you're when you're in there for lunch, do something for That's dinner. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and especially if you've got a busy day ahead of you and you've got the veggies in the fridge already cooked up, it feels like you've had a kitchen hand come in in the day. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you so much. Oh, um, you're so welcome. Amazing. Now, I noticed that you have an online cooking course. So, we will put the link for that in the show notes because oh, great. Thank people you. might like um, to have a look. I noticed that was only $99. It's yes, it is. Yes, yeah, so I just put it down so to make it more accessible for everyone. And it's got um, five modules. It's got a lot of, a lot of, seven hours of footage in there. So. Wow. That's yeah. huge. And it doesn't have a completion date, so you can, it's self paced. Yeah. 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 So you take people through all the basics, do you? Of Yeah. Of they make spice mixes from scratch and um, fridge staples like butter, cheese, hummus, pesto. Um, oh, there's lots of things. And there's even three desserts. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's main, there's main meals and. Um, sunflower, sour cream. Oh, there's so much in there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Lots of tips along the way, knife skills, and the whole lot. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, you're welcome. It was lovely. Lovely. It's been you. amazing. Bye.